Hello and welcome to Law Talk. My name is John Celebrezzi and I'm the co-founder of the Celebrezzi Zangi Community Legal Education Project, as we call it CZ CLEP for short. Our organization provides continuing education about the judiciary and legislature to attorneys, judges, government officials, and the general public. As a career ed educator, I recognize early on how important legal matters are and, and how they impact our lives. I am the nephew of the late Anthony J. Celebrezzi, who was the popular five-term mayor of Cleveland and a member of President Kennedy's cabinets. As a tribute to his lifetime commitment to the legal process, we dedicate this show. John's special guest today is Jason Ramsey. Jason is from Beloit, Ohio. He graduated with a bachelor's degree in politics, government, and history from Ohio Wesleyan University in 2007. During law school, Jason served as a member of the National ABA appellate team and as a staff editor on the Law Review. Upon graduation, he is interested in pursuing a career in the public realm. Now let's join John and Jason. Well, Jason, welcome to Law Talk. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Well, Jason, you uh, have the distinction of being my fourth guest in the last four years who was is our champion for the Anthony J. Celebrezzi Appellant Competition that happens at Ohio Northern University every year. Mm -hmm. And for that, we congratulate you. Thank you. And have looked forward to bringing you as a guest on Law Talk. Um, I know you're an aspirant law student. We'd like will soon be a lawyer. The year will be, you're in your, this will start your third year, right? That's correct, yep. So you have one more year of academics, then you have the, the good old bar exam to that's deal right. with about this time next summer. Yeah, that's right. Okay, all right. Well, okay. Um, I guess for the benefit of my, my viewers, uh, you are one of a very, very small group of people that have actually won this competition, and which is, uh, we're proud to say, is named in honor of my uncle Anthony J. Celebrezzi. I know all about it because for about as long as I can remember, I go every year and I, I observe and have been fortunate enough over the last few years to, to have the winners join me on the show. But for the benefit of my, of my viewers, Jason, could you tell them what is the Appellant Advocacy Competition in Ohio Northern? Sure, it's the, the Celebrezzi Competition is our, our most prestigious tournament, and it's only for exclusively for second and third year students. And we take a, a pending Supreme Court case, usually on a, an issue of constitutional law, and then pit students against each other in, in various rounds. I see. And it's one of the appellate advocacy uh, tournaments that the school puts on, in addition to a tournament for their first year students, which is tied in with their with one of their first year courses, their legal research and writing course, and also a, a trial advocacy competition in the fall. So this tournament is, is always in the spring. It's by far our most prestigious tournament. And of course, as you said, named in, in honor of Anthony Celebrezzi. So it's a, it's a very big deal around the school and always something that as an incoming student even, I heard about. Oh, okay. So I guess this is somewhat of a pinnacle for you. It is for second and third year students. You could, if you wanted to, uh, uh, compete again next year if you wanted, couldn't you? Well, I could. Uh, unfo I, unfortunately, I cannot because I'm, I'm actually a part of the Moot Court Executive Board I see. this upcoming year. And the Moot Court program at Ohio Northern runs the tournament and is often judging the tournament. Okay. So unfortunately, I can't put on no, my, okay. you know, put that hat down mm -hmm. and then put on my uh, advocacy hat. But you are going to actually still be involved with it, but um, dealing with the logistics of... My, maybe my next guest, right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> okay. and uh, making sure it runs without well, a hitch. All right, well, that's what we like to hear, and again, Uncle Tony would be proud. Um, a lot of people, I think a lot of people, don't quite grasp the concept of appellant advocacy. In other words, I think we, we watch so much Law & Order on mm -hmm. television, we know that there there's a trial someplace, and yeah. there's a judge, and somebody sometimes goes to jail and whatnot, but there's a whole lot more than that uh, uh, as, as we work through our all aspects of the appellant advocacy. And I guess uh, to win 
this competition, Jason, that you did on April 23rd, you had to prevail through a series of rounds. Uh, I, I guess I'm leading up to that to sort of make an analogy of here. You just didn't show up one day and win this competition. No. I mean, you were kind of in uh, the heat for a while. So how many rounds altogether? There were four rounds altogether. So if there were four rounds altogether, my guess is that, well, you won playing you have to remind me now. You, 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 what side were you on when you won? The appellant, the, the Shelby County, Alabama. Okay, but you did have to do the other side as well? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I had to argue both sides actually twice. It just turned out that way. And I guess that's the point I'd like my, my viewers to know about the competition, mm -hmm. that you have to be skilled on both sides. And absolutely. Of course, that's an aspect that we all learned in law school, you know, you play the role that you have to play. Right. Uh, sometimes in not necessarily appellant work, but only in trial work too, um, you get appointed to a case as much as you may not like the guy and might not like what he did, you're still going to have to zealously represent him. So it really doesn't have a whole lot of do to do with what team you were rooting for, right? Right, absolutely. Yeah. That uh, idea of going both ways. I've asked this question to my guests before, and I always want my, my viewers to know that, that you, you know, you, you, you were adept to sit on both sides. Mm -hmm. uh, police officers, and I had an officer tell me what, this once, actually have to train with their weapon that they can shoot in either hand, mm -hmm. which sort of makes sense in a situation. That's kind of an interest. I, that's kind of my analogy to what you had to do. Sure. You know, you, you were able to shoot on with either hand and, uh, and do it sure. pretty well. And, and it, was, it was over the course of about 10 days when we had all four of these rounds. So it was, it's a little bit of whiplash in a way because you go from arguing one side and then two days later we would have to argue the exact opposite and yeah. say, well, everything I just argued two days ago <laughs> was fundamentally wrong and, and, and not correct. So it was, it was very interesting and actually very difficult to, to make that turnaround, especially so quickly. So when we first got the problem, that was always in the back of my head, um, not to let my own conception sure. of, of the case or let my own bias sort of enter into it because I knew that if if I moved on in the tournament that I would have to argue both sides. Yeah, so it's, sides. it's a very, very difficult thing to do um, it, it, in the abstract. But once you're up there and, you, and you're doing it, um, you sort of see the arguments for both yeah. sides. And you, you see that these cases are before the Supreme Court for a reason because sure. there are valid arguments on both sides. On both sides, exactly. on both sides. Well, and I guess as an added attraction, by the time you got to the, 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 that fateful day, I saw you win on on April twenty third. You knew this court. You knew this case inside out, didn't you? Well, <laughs> I would like to think so. Well, um, I mean, yeah, yeah. My I, point is, you you, you really you, this thing has been researched one way and up the other. I mean, right. Uh, of course, it had already been argued before the Supreme Court by the time uh, we argued it uh, for the tournament. And so we had the advantage of going through the oral arguments at the Supreme Court, going through every sure. brief that was filed in the case, going through blogs and commentary. And of course, this was a, a, a very debated topic. And it's throughout history, in fact, uh, since the, the Voting Rights Act sure. was initially passed. So there's a lot of history on yeah. it. And, and it was it was good to be able to pull from all of that. Well, uh, and unfortunately, the, the Supreme Court doesn't happen to be on the timeline of my show, but, <laughs> uh, so they haven't ruled on it. But let's talk, let's talk about this. This year's problem dealt with Shelby County versus Holder, correct? That's correct. And the issue of it, it had to do with the Voting Rights Act passed by Congress in 2006, but the, that is the issue. But ex it has to do with exceeding its authority under the 14th and 15th Amendments of the United States Constitution. All right, there's a mouthful here, and I mean, we could probably talk for days on what I just, just brought up. <laughs> but for the benefit of, of my viewers and me, just tell us in your own words, Jason, what, like if I was up walking up to you in the street or I met you in McDonald's, what was that case all about? Tell us that way. Well, it's about whether or not Congress in 2006, they reauthorized the Voting Rights Act. It was originally passed back in 1965, and it basically 
it, it made sure that minorities, in particular African Americans in the South, actually had the ability to vote. Mm -hmm. uh, because at that time, there was, of course, many laws passed in the South that impeded minorities from sure, even getting sure, to the voting sure. booth or, or registering to vote. Yeah. And so the Voting Rights Act was passed by Congress in 1965, and it's been reauthorized several times throughout history. And every time, it, the Supreme Court has heard the argument that it just heard in, in this case, which is, oh, well, Congress can't do that. Because the states, of course, have enormous power when it comes to elections. And what the Voting Rights Act, in particular Section 5 of it, which was what this case is primarily about, it, it makes the states go to the federal government for any change that they make to their election laws. So even something as small as changing the location of a ballot box, of changing it from one high school to a newer high school, for I instance, see. would have to go to the federal government for approval. Okay. It's, it's this process called preclearance. And so the states have long argued, since the Voting Rights Act was initially passed, that that's unconstitutional, that Congress doesn't have the power to make the states so beholden to the federal government. And the Supreme Court has said, in this area, due to all the problems and due to the fact that discrimination against minorities sure. and African Americans was so prevalent, as particularly in the South, then this is fine. And the issue is really whether or not those issues, that discrimination still exists to the point that would allow Congress to reauthorize the Voting Rights Act in 2006. Okay, let's pick it apart a little bit. Sure. But that was excellent. In fact, I think I understand it better now than I ever did. From a historical perspective, we know that the amendments that we're talking about, the 14th, 15th, the Civil War amendments, 13th, right. 14th, 15th, 13th, having outlawed slavery. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so this really is all going back to Abraham Lincoln's days. It were, well, it started even before then, but the Civil War is over. Uh, uh, the African-American population is, is being recognized as citizens, but there's a great acceptance, long learning curve on this thing. Right. Okay, so by 1965, uh, which is, uh, I'm old enough to remember that mm -hmm. very well. A lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of turbulent activities going on in the United States of America, race riots, whatever. A uh, whole lot of progressive legislation coming out of the Congress. Right. But I guess, you know, I, I think people of your generation would look at 1965 like maybe I looked at 1865. <laughs> that was more history. But I guess the fact that you're you're telling us that. Congress is not going to let go of this thing. They're, they're going to be vigilant as to what I guess their purpose is, not to let us slide back to where we were. Now, it's hard to believe that that could happen, but right. am, I, am I correct in that analysis? No, that's, that's exactly correct. And, and Congress over time has sort of adopted new reasons for reauthorizing the Voting Rights Act because, of course, we're, we're not in the same position that that America was back in 1965. Sure. There is no longer in the South, for instance, these overt laws that the literacy tests, for right, instance, right, that, I remember that, well. right, that, that really made it certain that African Americans could Impossible. not vote. Right. Yeah. And so nowadays, you, you, you certainly don't have anything to that same extent. So Congress, when they reauthorized it, and the primary point that Shelby County and the opponents of the Voting Rights Act have, have said is, you're no longer basing this on what it was originally based on. The Voting Rights Act was meant to protect minorities and enable them to be able to vote. Mm -hmm. And in large part, they are now. And in fact, in some of these covered jurisdictions, covered by the Voting Rights Act in Section 5, uh, minority vote actually has exceeded in turnout, has exceeded white uh, vote in turnout and really? in, in registration. Yeah, there's some interesting statistics there to make their case. Right. And, and so Congress has instead looked at these, what they have termed as, as second generation barriers, which means, yes, minorities might have the ability to vote and they are able to register and then go vote, but their vote does not mean as much as, as for instance, a, a white individual's vote because of the way redistricting has been handled and, and certain other issues like that. So it has to do with what Congress has called voting dilution it's to the point where they're a minority or African-American vote in, say, in Alabama, 
might not mean the same thing as a, a white vote in Alabama. Well, that's an interesting point. I mean, uh, so the, I mean, on its face, the opponents are saying, "Hey, we don't need this anymore." I mean, it, you know, the, it's not 1965 where right. we've all progressed to where we are today. But a finer look at it, though, yeah, redistricting has a lot to do with it. I mean, there's that battle continues as we speak here in the, the, the state of Ohio as to how things get gerrymandered around and how it could affect the, uh, the racial uh, uh, population of a particular area. Right. All right, so pretty interesting case. Um, I know you won on the side that you won on, right. but do you want to be so bold as to predict how this thing is going to come down? <laughs> well, unfortunately, the, the Supreme Court has not issued a decision as of yet. It seems Well, they might be waiting for you. Jason. Yeah. Uh, I, I would humbly probably <laughs> say that's not the case. Uh, but it, it seemed from oral arguments and also from the fact that just four years ago, in another case that was pretty much the same yeah. as this, the Supreme Court punted on this issue by saying, we think the Voting Rights Act is a problem. We're just not going to address it right okay. now. And that's really when Shelby County said, well, we're going to bring mm -hmm. a suit to make sure that you address it. And, so this could be it. And exactly. And it seems like the, particularly the, the more conservative block of the Supreme Court has, has said that this is just no longer necessary okay. because of the extent that Section 5 goes. That the Voting Rights Act in general has been almost a victim of its own success because of, of what we were talking about, that this overt discrimination no longer exists. Sure. And it and truly is because of the Voting Rights Act. It it along with the Civil Rights Act, solved a lot of these issues. And so in that, in that way, it's a victim of its own success because it's, it simply might not be necessary anymore. So, so your read on it is there's a pretty good chase. They, they punted a few years ago, but this, this might be the real deal, the makeup of our court right now being pretty conservative. Do you think the states might win on this thing? Yeah, it, it seems that way. And it, it might be a, a lot more nuanced than that in saying that, in federal elections, for instance, maybe part of, part of the voting yeah, rights act, right. right? So it, it it could be very nuanced because they the court might be opposed to just out yeah, all right, outright right. overruling it. That's but, an interesting thought, though, because um, you know we we like our viewers to think about things that we're talking about here. You know, we all go to vote. We all go to vote. We're voting for local ordinances and the president of the United States at the same time. But the president and the Congress is a, a federal election. Right. Then we have our representatives and senators, our state elections. Then we have Wadsworth here, our local. But the average voter walks into the bo voting booth at the same place and time and right. whatever. Um, doesn't really look at all of these things. But if, in fact, they just sort of hang on to the federal part, kind of like term limits, found their way to the state legislature, but they don't find that they do not apply to congressmen, congresspersons. Correct. And, so. and actually, just last week, the Supreme Court had decided that, for instance, a, a mandating voter IDs in Arizona, a, a law in Arizona was overturned because it in, interfered with the, the, the federal elections. So they could still do it on the state level, but when it comes to federal elections, they couldn't mandate sure. uh, IDs to register to vote. That's really interesting. We're going to switch gears to law school now. I think you, you've done a fine job explaining the significance, and we will wait and see what the, the court does here within, hopefully, this summer. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, this might not even be the last, the last one. In other words, if they come down, as you use the word nuances, and maybe hold federal out but give some latitude to the state, it's very possible that we could have another case following said, no, we want more. Right. And uh, I imagine the advocates out there for that are pretty zealous, so whatever. Okay, let's shift gears. Uh, I think you've explained the legal significance. I wrote myself a note here to ask you that. Um, once again, uh, I've asked you this question, but <laughs> for the record, the side, now that we, you've explained the players, the side that you won on was? Shelby County, so I was at, I was arguing against the Voting Rights Act. Okay. I was arguing that Congress. Right, had you were the little guy. You, sure. You, you know, well, how about that? Yeah. Okay. All right. So you were you were the advocate for uh, the state's rights. The correct. Yeah, okay. All right. Uh, albeit we know you did play both sides, Jason. <laughs> right. you, you had to. Right. All right. Okay. Life at Ohio Northern University Law School, one of my favorite places. 
What class in law school covers these constitutional issues? Well, I, I would argue that pretty much every class does. No, you don't uh, have to argue it. <laughs> I mean, this time yeah. you don't have to argue it. Yeah. You just tell me. That's true. Uh, every class does um, in, in the sense that the Constitution, of course, is so important. When we're looking at these, these cases, um, almost all of them will revert back to the Constitution in some way. No, not, come but, on, Jason. You're telling me that you're talking about stuff like this in torts? Not necessarily, no. And that's that's why we do have con law is on the bar, of oh, course, right. um, yeah. and Sorry. it's mandated at Ohio Northern for second year students to take at least one semester, and then we can follow up with with a second ses semester of constitutional. Okay, law. so you're not. If I'm hearing you, I mean, admittedly, all things tie together. That's the huge web of of the law, but if I'm hearing you correctly, uh, everybody going through Ohio Northern and probably other law schools are going to take at least one semester of constitutional law. Yep. Okay. I, I had to actually take, but that's a long time ago, Con Law 1 and Con Law 2. Mm -hmm. It was interesting. I still remember that because I took them in the same semester. It was kind of interesting. Uh, and that is, a, that is a part, hopefully a year from now as you're, you're preparing for the bar, you, you will be tested on constitutional law. Absolutely. Okay. So that's a mainstay here, mainstay of becoming a lawyer. Yep, absolutely. All right. Well, that's pretty heavy duty stuff. Okay. Uh, switching back to you know the more people side of it, what was the most difficult part of this competition for you? I mean, you, you seemed as cute. I was there. I mean, don't just go to your head, but you were as cool as a cucumber. I mean, you really were. I was ten feet away from you, but you had to have uh, some nervousness at some point in time. Oh, absolutely, and particularly because the final round was judged by uh, real judges. Oh, yeah. And it, it was the first time I had ever been before a, a real judge that, I mean, that's, that's their craft. That's what they oh, do sure, for a sure. living. And so it was very intimidating because I, I had no idea what kind of questions would be thrown, and, that, and that's every round. And that's why I was nervous before every round because it, depending on who was, who was judging at the particular I time, you. I you. if it was a professor, for instance, or an alumni we had come in as well during one of the rounds. And it would just be very different as to what they would pick out of the case and then question you about. So it may not even be anything that I necessarily prepared for or specifically, and it might not be anything that myself or, or somebody that I was facing were, were really emphasizing, but it's what the judge had picked out. Sure, and, sure. And, you, and you, when you go over the transcripts of, of these Supreme Court cases, you see that all the time, that the, the, the counsel are, are sort of thrown back at, well, that's not really important, but of, I mean, of course, if the judge is asking yeah, you, that's I guess it's important. Yeah, yeah that's, exactly. So that's that was really making sure that I could Never answer really those questions. I mean, I, 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 your your colleagues who have been on the show have given other answers to it over the years. I always I, I always ask that question because I just kind of want to know what's going through your head. But for the benefit of our viewers, we had Judge Preston, who sits on the Third District uh, Court of Appeals. Mm -hmm. We had. An, there was another appellate court judge as well. Uh, judge Putrakowski from the 6th Sixth District. Sixth, oh, by Toledo. That's okay. correct. And then our third was? The Allen County prosecutor, was prosecutor uh, yeah. Jurgen Waldick. Okay. Uh, so, I mean, not to take anything away from him. He's a very intelligent man. But you had two appellate judges there from really varying parts of the state of Ohio as far as how they're – the Toledo area is really – I lived in that area for a long time. Toledo area being – quite different as far as the makeup of the court versus Judge Preston in the third district. It takes in like about 17 counties all through that right. area. Okay, so yeah, you had no idea what was coming up, what those guys got in the back of their mind. One of the things I find, and they, I thought they were reasonably humane about it, but uh, I, I've, I've, in fact, I, a colleague of mine argued a, a case before the Ninth District Court of Appeals this past week, and um, I just kind of went for moral support. And uh, she didn't get her first question out of her mouth, Jason, for that, just just stopped her right there, broke mm -hmm. her momentum. And uh, I thought I complimented her, I said, you did great. And, uh, but, I mean, it just changed the tenor of the whole, I, I think everything she had practiced for, or trying to prepare for this thing. So that's a pretty good point. I guess, it, you know, what they always say, Jason, it could have been worse. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, you're going to get, a, I think, a chuckle out of it could have been worse. 
This is going back about 10 or 12 years ago. Well, it's going back to about 1997. Uh, my uncle sat on that panel, mm. and he actually judged you guys, uh, which was pretty interesting to watch. You know, he sat on the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals, and he wasn't President Kennedy's cabinet. And of course, his portrait is there, or whatever. Of course. Uh, and albeit he was my uncle, you know, he, he, he was pretty brutal. Uh, <laughs> he, he really was. It was always kind of interesting to when he did that. I, I'd come every year to watch him. Uh, it was pretty obvious who the competition was named after, even how the other judges operated, though. Mm -hmm. But uh, so, okay, so that's a good point. I mean, you, if you're in appellate work, uh, you could be scrapping your, your, your game plan real quick. So Exactly. Okay, actually, uh, I got another question here. Actually, a small number of law students participate in these types of competitions because you did in one. How do you think that experience will actually help you as a you know, prospective attorney? Well, I, I think the, the skills that apply to, to oral advocacy, even just at the start of it, getting a case and really analyzing it from both sides, as we had talked about before, is, is really vitally important for any sort of work. If it's appellate work or trial work or even, or even other sort of legal work, it's, it's really analyzing those issues and breaking down, breaking down the sure, issues in sure. that. And, and that's really what I, I gained from it. And also just the, the exposure to being able to argue in front of varying benches, in yeah, front from of both sides to boot. Exactly, exactly, and and that's it's really enjoyable after the fact. Of course, yeah. in the middle of it, you're terrified, <laughs> but after the fact, you you look back on it, you say, you know, I can really apply what I did and how I went about these problems to to any area of law, to whatever I'm doing, and making sure that when I'm, for instance, when I'm laying out a legal argument, I'm I'm doing so in a way that a lot of different people will, will sure. understand what I'm saying. Sure. Makes sense. Makes right. perfect sense. I mean, it, law school is a pretty trying time, as I know and you know, and probably a lot of our viewers know. And, it, you know, it's hard to find the time to do this. Uh, but I guess my last question is, I know you're not going to do it again because you're going to be part of the moot court competition, but your primary motivation for this, in a word, why did you do this? I mean, it, it, you really are a very small there was a very small number of students that stepped forward that put themselves through this. I mean, yeah, it, it, experience is why I did it because okay. I, I, there are not many opportunities to be able to to argue in front of real judges before we're out in the legal world. And it's one of the things that I think Ohio Northern does in particular is is really give students the opportunity to have practical skills, and that's really what what I gained from that and and why I decided to be a part of it. Well, the time went by pretty fast, Absolutely. but I would like to thank you and again congratulate you for being my guest on Law Talk today. Uh, and of course, wish you the very best in your, not only your senior year in law school, but also um, your career as a lawyer. Um, this probably will be an experience that will out, you'll think back on for your entire career, which, which as a member of the Celebrity family, I'm very proud that I had something to do with that. So. Well, thank you so much for your family support all throughout this. Comments made by John's guest on Law Talk are solely those of his guests and do not necessarily reflect the views of Celebrezzi Zangi Community Legal Education Project. To view this show and others, go to www.cdzclub.org. In the Wandsworth area, a complete listing of dates and times of this broadcast, tune in to WCTV Channel 15 or log on to wandsworthcity.com and follow the links to WCTV. At CZ Clip, we're devoted to the education of today's legal issues. Fueled by the public's keen interest in our legal system and current events, CZ Clip is dedicated to the educational venues aimed at enhancing the understanding by all citizens regardless of age, education, occupation, or wealth. A function of the Celebrezzi Zangi Community Legal Education Project. <laughs>